Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm so very glad that you've taken time and decided to spend this next 30 minutes with us with the AMA Prioritizing Equity Series. I'm Mia Keys, and I serve as the, the Director of the Health Equity Policy and Advocacy, um, or excuse me, the Director of, of Health Equity Policy and Advocacy of the Center for Health Equity of the AMA. And I, I'm hoping that these next 30 minutes are really the most meditative that you spent all day, because what we're going to do is talk about trauma-informed approaches uh, that impact how we're able to advance equity among minoritized and marginalized communities, particularly during this COVID-19 season. And so we have just uh, three incredible souls with us today who are going to bring not only their expertise advice, but then also their full selves. And I'm so very grateful today. And I just want to go ahead and um, introduce them. Um, as you see them on your screen, uh, we have here with us uh, Dr. L. Tony Lewis, who serves as the president and founder of Liberation Health Strategies, and she's also the co-founder of the Health Equity uh, Cipher. Welcome to you, Dr. Tony. We're so glad that you're here. We also have with us uh, Dr. Nadia Richardson, my earring twin, who is a mental health advocate and DEI trainer and president and professor at the uh, University of Alabama Birmingham School of Health Pro uh, profession, uh, Professions. And I'm very glad that you're, you're with us today, Nadia. Thank you so very much for being here. And last but certainly not least, we have Alec Kallick who joins us today um, at, and representing the Palma Band of Luisano Indians. And he's also a global public health student, um, both MD and PhD student at the UC San Diego School of Medicine. So this young man quite certainly has a lot on his plate and we're, we're grateful that he's able to join us today. He also serves in the capacity as a national policy director for the Association of Native American Medical Students. So Dr. Tony, Dr. Richardson, Alec, thank you so much. Thank you very much. I just wanna know before we get into the conversation, you know, let's just ground set a little bit. How are you and where are you in the world? And I will start with Dr. Tony. Ooh, um, so hello, everyone. It's so good to be here. Um, and I would love to actually take maybe 30 seconds of my time to make it actually meditative mm -hmm. and have us all take a nice, like, deep breath in and breathe out. And maybe let's do two more. Breathe in and breathe out. And one more good time. Breathe in and breathe out. Hmm. So with that, I'm immediately maybe a little bit better than I was 10 seconds before or three hours before because it's been a hectic morning, but I'm good, all things considered. And I am in um, Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn, um, also on Lenape land. So. That's where I am. I, I don't have words to offer the deepest appreciation for where you've just taken us in so very quick of a, of a time period. Thank you, Dr. Tony. Nadia, Dr. Richardson, how are you and where are you in the world? I'm, I'm doing good and I appreciate the start to this call too because I do those breathing exercises often and it makes a huge difference in your mental well-being, but also physically, I feel it immediately. So I appreciate that. Um, I'm located in Birmingham, Alabama. So living that virtual life um, and trying to strike a seeming balance because sometimes when you love what you do, this virtual life makes you feel like you have more time to do it. Um, but we really need to be intentional about checking out and resting. Um, I'm not always good at it, but I do have some accountability partners and, um, and I appreciate that. And I appreciate you for sure. Thank you so very much, Dr. Richardson. Alec, how about you? What's going on in your world and where in the world are you? Uh, a lot's going on. Um, Miu Yum, uh, hello everyone. It's so great to be here with all of you. I'm calling in from sunny San Diego, uh, finally above 70 degrees. So happy to be enjoying some sunlight uh, from the occupied land of the Kumeyaay Nation. Um, I'm doing okay, um, all things considered with navigating graduate school during a global pandemic, but you know, being a public health student, um, really no better time um, to be learning um, in the classroom, but also applying what I'm learning um, in these conversations. So very much excited. 
Definitely excited for sure to carry this conversation on with you. So I have a question for another question for all of you. And Alec, I'll actually start with you, you know, especially because you are carrying so much on your plate as all of us are, you, you embody really, you know, being able to use Nadia's word balance in a lot of ways, you know, but I just want to know, you know, given that COVID is affecting all of us in, in maybe in the same way, but in different ways, right? But there are others who are specifically experiencing increases in uh, depression and feelings of anxiety in substance abuse. Um, Self-harm is also on the rise, particularly among marginalized and minoritized communities um, during this time. I just want to know, what are some strategic approaches you've seen being used um, or that you have used in your work or in your daily life uh, to address these traumas um, around the pandemic? Um, certainly. It's such an important question, Mia. Um, I think with one in 475 Native Americans dead from COVID-19, everyone has been affected in some way. And we know that intergenerational trauma and adverse childhood experiences are major contributors to the disproportionately high rates of depression, self-harm, and other mental health challenges that we already see across Indian country. And these, of course, are not the only factors when we consider chronic underfunding of the Indian Health Service and really a lack of robust uh, behavioral and public health infrastructure that centers indigenous perspective. And there are, of course, uh, geographical variations in these inequities, but I really want to speak to the work that is being done and not simply paint a negative picture uh, because our communities are much more than a simple statistic. Um, the SAMHSA and the IHS have long supported community directed grant programs to implement early intervention and treatment services for our youth who, to be frank, represent the future of our tribal nations. Um, after decades of ill-informed federal policies like boarding school and urban relocation, it seems that we're never more than a generation away from cultural extinction and connection to culture has long been recognized as a behavioral health protective factor for our youth. So. Many programs have shifted to the virtual space, which is of course no substitute for physical interaction, but um, I think um, you know, really trying to ensure that we're reaching as many communities as possible and community partners have really worked to bridge the digital divide. And personally, um, you can always find me on Facebook checking out the latest posts on social distance powwow and their mission is to um, foster a space for community and cultural preservation. Um, and to retain cultural knowledge through indigenous voice. And they really work to bring our historically disregarded uh, but unquestionably needed perspectives to the world for future generations because we are all going through crisis and it's really important to root ourselves in community. Wow, Alec, thank you so very much for sharing that. And I hope that we can make sure to uh, reference social distance powwow in the, in the chat. You know, one of the things that, that you know, you've said so much, but the thing that really strikes me is you gave us, you know, the connection to culture as being the, the strategy that holds us, but you're also talking about surviving and, you know, and fighting against, you know, past oppressions that are so very current um, even today. So it's not just about survival for the moment. You're talking about survival on top of survival. And when you're talking about, um, in this, I want to then throw to you, Dr. Dr. Tony, you know, when you're talking about depression, anxiety, and, and these things, you know, what else are you also recognizing in, in addition to cultural connection to keep us, keep us well during, uh, during the pandemic? You know, I'm so appreciating everything Alex said, you know, um, about cultural connection and understanding that this is a multi-tiered astral future focus, all of the things, you know, at once. And so, you know, what else am I seeing? I think, um, you know, when we talk about trauma, a lot of times that comes with like a particular picture, but like, I love how like in conversation, you know, with folks, it's just like, we're just talking about our wounds, you know, um, what hurts, but we're also talking about kind of sharing our strategy, almost like we're kind of in the kitchen together, figuring out our recipes and, you know, sharing our tweaks, you know, whether it's ginger or scotch bonnet or whatever. And like to Alex's point again about like us kind of, we're not just our trauma or our wound, like this focus on like the love of, of joy within our culture. There's a reason why people were with D-Nice and why, you know, Queen Sugar talked about let's, let's not let people steal our joy. 
I think people are getting creative because even those of us who claim to have like a deep and strategic spiritual toolkit on how to deal with depression, mental health, intergenerational, we're in a whole new time where we got to kind of mix it up. So like that thing where like we have to stay in community and find kind of who are almost like where who our mental health pod is, you know, in this time where we can just be able to snotty cry when we need to, you know, um, and also be able to like bring your fullness of the here are three things that worked for me um, and not be afraid to say depression, anxiety, miscarriage, suicide, to say these things so that we can all get about our truth and then use our light and our shared recipes to kind of, you know, reveal what we need and deal with what we have and then heal for our future. It's really the togetherness in that way is liberating. And, and, mm -hmm. and I, I very much appreciate that both of you mentioned media, you know, social media togetherness. You talked about D nice and, and, and dancing and music togetherness. And you mentioned Queen Sugar. I appreciate all of these cultural points. And Nadia, same, same question for you. You know, what are some approaches that you're seeing are really helpful or that you use um, with respect to addressing these traumatic experiences, this traumatic experience overall too of COVID? Absolutely. So I'm absolutely inspired and encouraged um, by affinity groups that are using social media because at this time where we can't be with each other to create these intentional spaces where they can share, but not just share and learn from each other, celebrate our resilience. I agree with what was said earlier is that sometimes we focus so much on what's going on wrong and the disparities that we have to live with in all the time and these oppressive environments that we go into every single day, whether it's our work environment, navigating the healthcare system, navigating criminal justice system, navigating whatever systems you may name, um, being able to meet with each other, build resilience, celebrate ourselves, encourage each other, and also share resources. Um, with No More Martyrs, again, we're a mental health awareness campaign um, for Black women and girls. We connect individuals to not just Black providers, but providers who are culturally responsive. You know how they say not all skin folk are your kin folk? I'm not just going to send you to someone because they have the same melanin. I want to send you to someone who is committed to acknowledging and supporting and encouraging your full holistic wellness. Um, another thing that we're doing through our organization is um, I think a lot of times social media gets a bad rap because there is so much um, information and images on there that can be traumatizing, but empowering individuals to curate their timeline. When I go to my timeline, whether it's um, Facebook or Instagram, I am fed by wonderful individuals who are posting wonderful things. Um, and the same individuals who are running these social media platforms who record the algorithms acknowledge what I like to see. Um, so if there's something that pops up that I don't like to see, I have the power to take that off and it's recorded in the algorithm that says, you know what, we're not gonna show you this, we're gonna show you a little bit more of this. So I see positive images of wellness. I see positive images of women and affinity groups doing community work. And, and so that's another thing too, is within these groups, getting connected to resources, um, being reminded of your resilience and being empowered to curate your space. Oh, can I, can I? You, I was going to ask you to, please? to do Ooh. that. Yes, go because ahead. Because when you said the power to turn that off, <laughs> like boundaries is such, you know, a whole tool, whether it's, you know, shutting down the screen, turning off the, um, you know, the TV or the news or just, you know, whatever, being mindful of the energy that's coming your way and having some intention on like the balance, you know, or I don't know, balance feels bi-directional, but we know it's, it's more like this, right? Um, so thank you for bringing that part up because I feel like that whole, even if it's just figuring out, um, do not disturb an airplane mode on your phone, you know, and who gets through and just giving yourself time to rest um, and understand that it's a lot is, is such a key part for all of this. I want to stick with you, Dr. Dr. Tony, because you're, hmm. the, between the two of you, you were helping to, in a lot of ways, enumerate some key components to wellness during you know such a traumatic time. So for what are what are if you had to count or, or enumerate those approaches, those trauma informed approaches, um, you know how to, to best in address the uh, the trauma of COVID nineteen. What mm -hmm. would you what would you name them? Well, it's interesting. Those key components. Yeah. For for the key components, and I think um, 
one of the first things we need to do, you know, from an equity lens view screen, however you want to say it, is get outside of there being like one particular type of trauma or one definition of wound. Because I think that has a lot of people who are suffering thinking, well, maybe my hurt doesn't count because it's not COVID or because it's not depression or because I'm not suicidal. So I think if we step back from an equity lens and kind of begin to rewrite all of that historical context and say, let's let's get real about what our wounds are mentally, physically, spiritually, economically, community to identify them. You know, I think that's that's the the trauma informed as we define trauma. Um, and then, you know, I'm gonna speak to some of my clinicians here about in terms of the soap note format, like once you identify the kind of problems, then you can kind of start to figure out what wounds need addressing. And so I love how like there's a, a body of work and a, a community that's, you know, kind of bringing up this vibe and saying, you know, so instead of just saying trauma informed, let's say trauma informed, but liberation focused or healing focused or love focused or joy focused or whatever, so that we understand what, how we're addressing and where we're getting to. So if key components are to first kind of just get really quiet with yourself, your community, your people, your family, whoever it is, so you can know your wounds and then address them. And in this moment, it's not, it's COVID, it's racism, it's economics, it's sexism, it's all of the things, it's, you know, politics, it's, it's all of the things that might be calling it. Let's not like kind of make it a hierarchy of whether or not you're personally attached to COVID. Um, but like that whole piece of identifying it and then addressing it. And then again, kind of getting in the kitchen to like pick your tools. And that tool may be a therapist. I love my friends, Shana Marie Brown at like Liberate um, Therapy that liberates. There are many different kind of sources out there or healing circles. Like we do at Liberation Health Strategies, like they do at Genesis Healing Institute where we just have a collective of folks that have modalities that address mind, body, and spirit. And we kind of all get together and create that stew for whatever we need. So I think those are like components. Like if you think of ingredients, what are the wounds? What do they need? What do we have? And then bringing together what we need to address. And then understanding when you need to pull that other lever, you know, when you need to pull that lever and you need additional help. So I really appreciate that. Calling it what it is, addressing it finding your tools. But then you also said, come to the quiet, which we were talking offline earlier a little bit about yoga. And what I absolutely know from yoga, and it, it certainly maps onto life, people have a hard time coming to the quiet. It is really hard to get to stillness in a world that has us doing all of this, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I play just a little bit, I'm gonna play. And I, I want Alec and Dr. Nadia to jump in because uh -huh. like, you know, stillness and quiet, like again, like these terms that try to put it in one particular thing, like mindfulness and meditation. But that was my grandma telling me to sit in the corner and be quiet for a second. You know, that's also me taking a drive or maybe listening to my favorite song where I can just surrender into it for a second. There's so many ways to still, you know, um, that we have to find so we can listen in here. Come and this on. gets back to Dr. Richardson's point about resilience and, and you know, self-inform. And so I want to I, I want to pitch the next question to you then, um, Dr. Nadia. I, I, I'm, I'm this you all have to know this is my good my good soul friend, too. So every time I see her on the screen, I just get so excited. I'm very excited for all of you, for sure. But this is this is this is a very healing and good space. So I want to know, you know, you know, what healthcare advances have been made in your estimation? through these trauma-informed, liberating approaches, joy approaches to care, uh, as Dr. Tony mentioned, and, and how do we continue to build on them, build on those advances and, and spread the access to them? Absolutely. Um, I think some of the healthcare advances um, is just the fact that it's patient-centered, right? It's patient-centered. It puts um, patients in the middle of the conversation and allows them to name the trauma for themselves, right? And it empowers them to create their own wellness plan, their own, their own treatment plan. Um, and what we're seeing now through research is that um, that is giving rise to a more biopsychosocial approach to care, right? I think we've seen that in writing, we've seen it in research, we know the benefits of it, but we've still been operating very much in a very traditional medical model and not one that really acknowledges the personal 
and the societal and the other things that are going on that impact wellness. What we're seeing now is that trauma-informed gives rise to better patient outcomes. And I think that that's very positive. I think the next step that we need to go um, is getting that embedded in some of the curriculum that's required for medical doctors, right? So when you think about some of the medical curriculum, you have their traditional um, epidemi epidemiology, you have the traditional anatomy, you have these traditional um, curriculums that are important and necessary and needed. But I know when I was working with the medical school, I thought, wow, we're not talking about social determinants of health. We're not talking about health disparities. Like this is not required curriculum. And if we can't talk about that, then how could we ever really embed, truly embed um, intentionally embed conversations about trauma-informed. Um, I'm seeing it now more, so I'm, I'm hopeful for that, but I'm also seeing it offered as electives. And what I wanna see is that offered as required curriculum, because if you're really going to sit and create a space where patients feel heard, seen, and um, we know that that will lead to better drug adherence and better health outcomes, um, I need to know that you know how to do those things before you get into that patient-doctor interaction. So, um, so I'm inspired. I'm inspired by that. I'm glad to see the things that are happening. We know that SAMHSA and the CDC came out with these guidelines, um, principles for trauma-informed approaches to care, um, and some of those things do include an acknowledgement of culture and history and um, race, gender issues, and it does include peer support and it does include collaborations. Um, I think all the wording is there. Now we just need intentional strategies to put those things into action. Um, and I, I believe that's going to happen um, because I think the patients now see it for themselves and so they're going to um, demand it. Mm. Yeah, you, and I'm, I'm, I, in my mind, what you don't see happening in my mind is me grabbing onto these you know, really very powerful um, points that you're making. And uh, Alec, I wanted, want to actually harken back to something that you said, which, which really reminds me of what uh, Dr. Richardson just mentioned, you know, you're talking about culture, you're talking about specifically the needs of the American Indian populations, right? And so I'm wondering if you can expound on some of the things you were talking about earlier and loop in some of the things that Nadia mentioned, you know, so if you were to talk to your, your peer student physicians, um, medical students, you know, or, and other physicians, um, what would you want physicians and medical students to know about American Indian trauma-informed systems of care specifically? Um, you know, I think, um, you know, as evidenced by, you know, the last two questions, you know, this moment really demands transformative action. And according to the AAMC, only 11% of U.S. medical schools teach anything about American Indian and Alaska Native health. And when you don't center these perspectives and contextualize, you know, thousands of years of history, you tend to really just focus on the negative. And at UC San Diego, I was the only American Indian student in my class. And people often asked me, you know, what motivates your advocacy? And I would tell them isolation and, you know, working with our faculty, working with our leadership, uh, first year medical students now have a two year or two year, two hour lecture on California Indian history to really contextualize our communities on the land that our medical school sits on. And, you know, I'm much more than a medical student. I am a Luceno man who happens to be going to medical school. And when we talk about health, I think we really center this Western definition that focuses almost exclusively on your physical health, but it is so much more than that. It's this complex interplay between your physical, mental, social, and spiritual health. And you know, if you neglect one, you know, you may find yourself really out of balance. And I look to what uh, tribal leaders and, you know, those in healthcare are doing in California. And there was this project published in 2015 that aims to improve the integration of behavioral health and primary care for urban American Indians. And, you know, I want to point out, um, you know, to our viewers that the majority of the American Indian population lives in urban centers like Los Angeles and Chicago, but that was not necessarily by choice, um, because in the 1950s, the federal government relocated thousands of Native families um, from reservations with the promise of economic opportunity and a better future. And it represented one of the final attempts to assimilate our communities into American society. And they you know, in their report, they go into the, you know, dismantling of indigenous systems of wellness uh, from cultural genocide to relocation. And it was, you know, almost, you know, surgical like in terms of, you know, what was done to ensure that, you know, we could not connect to our traditional practices and, um, you know, provide these services to our community members. And, you know, for example, you know, how does, 
an indigenous provider bill insurance for traditional health practices that don't align with the DSM-5. So what I want physicians and medical students to know that um, about these issues is that there's this complex history of genocide, structural racism and trauma that continues to this day. And they should be able to realize that tra trauma, um, as, as was pointed out earlier, is very multi-level and functions at the individual, family, and community level. And you should be able to recognize the signs of trauma, how it is culturally specific. You know, there are 18 tribes in San Diego County and 574 in the United States. Each one is different. You know, there's no such thing as American Indian culture and history because it is specific to each tribe. And you're organizations should be able to respond to these crises and partner with tribal practitioners to develop trauma-informed systems of care and really resist um, you know, passive and active re-traumatization of patients through micro and macro aggressions in the clinical space. And you know, I can't emphasize how important language is here. And you should really develop a relationship with the communities around you. And you know, I I, I don't use it as a cheap point, but don't rely on the annual cultural competency training to get you through a situation that could have been prevented with an active effort to center indigenous perspectives. So a very long answer, but I think it really you know, demands you know, an explanation. <laughs> Alec taught us earlier how to use the reactions and I was really trying not to clap and heart every single thing that you were saying, but thank you for that. Um, let me just briefly, and I know we, we have a couple of minutes left, but Alec, in your experiences with communicating to medical students, to physicians, those very words, what's been the, what have been some of the responses? Um, you know, I think, um, you know, depending on where you grew up, you may not be too familiar with American Indian history. And that is unfortunately by design when we think about the structuring of our K through 12 curricula. And many of my peers um, have been very receptive and they've acknowledged their gaps in knowledge and um, they really, you know, in they don't seek me out necessarily for information. They seek it out for themselves first, um, as opposed to burdening me with kind of being the one-stop uh, shop for information. And I really appreciate that. Um, and I couldn't be happier where I'm going to school today. I'm very glad to hear that. And Alec, of course, we'll continue to stay in touch with you because there's a lot of work that's, that's really bubbling within the AMA, particularly amongst our, our med ed uh, related works. And so this is something we're really very keen to and something that we're deeply sensitive to. Um, and we're looking to, to advance that work through the Center for Health Equity and our partners across the business unit. So thank you. So we have three minutes left, folks. I wish we had 30 more, but um, for, the, for the sake of being respectful of everyone's time and space, I just wanna go and hear um, some words from you about, you know, what you're personally doing to um, use Dr. Tony's words to, to go on airplane mode these days and then to just uh, find your own spaces to recenter, relax, whether for a moment or for extended periods of time, if you don't mind sharing. I'll start with you, Nadia. Okay, so I'll give you Two, a couple of different examples. Some of the things I do, um, as I love to dance, you know, I love to dance. And so I will turn up music in my house and dance. I can't necessarily go to the classes I would like to go to or a studio I would like to go to, um, but I, I turn up music and I dance. That's a release for me, it's energy. That's, you know, how they were talking earlier about finding your different types of quiet. Dance is quiet for me. Going out in nature is quiet to me. I've never been someone that could meditate inside. I really kind of need to be outside and even preferably by some water. So there are not too, there are a few lakes that are not too um, far from my house. Um, I can drive out there and sit and I, I do that from time to time. But my work is a part of that too. You know, um, I, I feel like sometimes with all the injustice, what we're facing, we can easily fall into this feeling of hopelessness and helplessness. And one of the ways I offset that is by becoming action oriented. So to me, advocacy and activism is a mental health strategy for me. It takes that energy and says, I'm going to do something about it. It acknowledges 
injustice and what that does to my psyche. But it says, you know what, I have the ability to bring about change that's not going to just impact myself, but it will impact others. Um, so I do that in my education work. I do that in my work through No More Martyrs. I do that by supporting other um, efforts and um, programs and camp campaigns. Um, so those are just a few of the ways I, I do that. And then of course, there's always that beautiful, luxurious, unapologetic sleep. <laughs> Thank you for that, Dr. Richardson. Dr. Tony. So I'm gonna hang out with Dr. Richardson, like for real, for real. Um, I'm gonna shout out two things. One, water, Yes. by every means. Drinking it, bathing in it, listening to oceans and waterfalls, being like understanding the sacred of it, you know? Um, and just appreciating all of that, you know, in addition to Dr. Richardson's amazing list. And then kind of piggybacking on some of the um, amazing things that, you know, Alec was talking about, like, I feel like this, um, you know, white supremacy culture has benefited from us not telling the fullness of our stories and our love and our joy and our culture. Um, and the way to get equity and justice and liberation is to lift that. So like, I'm loving the culture that's out that's showing, you know, that before the Tulsa massacre was joy and family and resilience and flyness and, you know, Lovecraft country that was doing that. And I'm, you know, listening to my mom talking about the fun that was around the west side of Chicago. So like finding all the stories and all the art and all the places and like just inundating myself with the music, the art, the love, the joy, the poetry that either came from those times of struggle and resilience that was lifted it or like that's like being birthed now like is amazing. Like I keep that stuff kind of on so that I'm tripping over like joy and creativity to inspire me and to feed me. Thank you, Dr. Tony. Alec, do you care to share? Um, I'll, I'll keep it pretty short. Um, you know, I think in uh, the course of the pandemic, I've really seen this uh, period of academic hyper productivity, and I've really learned the power of saying no. Um, you know, it seems like there's a new opportunity in my email inbox um, every day, and you know, it says, um, you know, we hope you find you find you well, and I just want the emails to stop finding me. <laughs> um, and I, um, you know, have really taken uh, power in, you know, centering my own mental health and you know, telling you know, myself and others that it's okay to not be okay. Um, and I've also started to bake bread, um, which is a new, a new venture for me, um, which has been really interesting, um, but to each their own. Yes, well, but I think to each their own, but then we can also potentially borrow from one another, derive strength. And now, and just in closing, share, I, I share some things that you all mentioned, but um, one in particular is also just um, symbology of symbols of strength and surrounding myself with symbols of strength. Um, and, and in fact, today I, I wore a literal symbol of strength and, and Nadia is wearing a, the same symbol. This is a, a Ghanaian Adinkra symbol that actually signifies ram's horns. And uh, ram, it, it's a bird's eye view of ram's horns. And so when you see rams kind of going at one another, it's certainly a symbol of strength, but it's also a symbol of of humility and um, just just understanding that they're they're uh, they're not mutually exclusive, um, um, just perspectives to have and, and postures to to take. So, again, I'm really grateful for the time we spent. I wish we had more, but I certainly hope that we will spend time together in the future. My hope and highest prayers is uh, consist of you know wellness for you and for your family. Um, and I will leave it there, Alec. I'm not going to ask you for for anything else, but Dr. L. Tony Lewis, thank you for your time. Future Dr. Alec Callick, thank you so much for coming through. Dr. Nadia Richardson, I very much appreciate you and your space. I'm Mia Keyes, Center for Health Equity. Thank you all viewers, and we look forward to the next time we can spend time.